think I would like to also say that it's, we need to celebrate the um, incredible advances in the middle of backlash, in the middle of fundamentalisms of the LBT community. I think it's been a difficult struggle. It is a difficult struggle. But you can see advances in Latin America in terms of legislative initiatives, in mm -hmm. terms of new jurisprudence. Then, of course, the, there is the backlash always. And, uh, what are really hate crimes are called, you know, d sort of domestic violence crimes. So I would like to celebrate um, with you uh, just by mentioning that I think the LBT community in Latin America is making huge strides. And finally, um, you know, some of, some of us <laughs> activists have been around for quite a while, and I think there's a level of tiredness but I also think there is a very interesting and uh, new emphasis on looking at caring for ourselves, about self-care, about um, how we look after our spirituality, etc. So I'll just end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, and I think, you know, you did a really great job of summing up, you know, what is quite a big region to have to, to sum up, but also bringing to light, I think, some issues that we haven't necessarily talked about in much detail here so far. So bringing in the work that women are doing around um, the environmental movements, but also, you know, including the, the struggles and the work that, that LBT peoples um, are organizing around in the region, I think, has been really good to hear um, for us to hear about. Um, one of the things that I think you brought about really well as well was talking about the struggles, the revolutionary struggles that young women, that young people in the region are engaged in. And, and so on that note, I'll hand it over to Manisha, who will be talking a little bit about the work um, and the issues that are coming out from her region. Um, but she, I should say she is um, talking about quite a broad region, so she will be talking about the work in Afghanistan, but also I think you mentioned you talk a little bit about the work that women are doing around um, the Arab Springs and the revolutions in the Middle East, so over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm from Afghanistan and I'll, I'll speak ab about Afghanistan a little bit. I'm supposed to be representing the Middle East. Afghanistan <laughs> is technically in Asia. But culturally, I think we're more closer to the Middle East than Asia, because Asia is considered you know, China, Japan. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan really doesn't have much in common with China or Japan or any of those other countries. Um, we're culturally very close to the Middle East, because the Middle East and Afghanistan and Pakistan, to that note, or Iran, um, they're all very tribal countries. Um, so Afghanistan is very tribal, and everything they do is, is, is tribes and tribal. So um, I have to say that um, this is a very t a scary time for Afghanistan right now, as we sit here, because negotiations are happening with the Taliban behind the scenes. Um, it's very, un it's not very transparent. We don't know what's happening or what's what's happening or what's not happening. Nobody's saying anything. We just know that negotiations are happening. In 2001, when the U.S. W invaded Afghanistan, I was very happy. Every, every woman I know, even men, they were all very happy and said, because um, that was the only way to save Afghanistan and Afghan women. Um, we were all happy. And, and the, UN, uh, the U.S. went uh, to Afghanistan, not mainly, but partly to save Afghan women, as they said at that time. Um, but sitting here today doesn't look or feel that uh, that was true because, you know, we, they, they, the, the U.S. went there, Afghanistan was uh, liberated, the Taliban were uh, finished and, you know, the, the government was installed and everything was going as, pl as planned and then years passed and, it's, and the Taliban sort of became a little more stronger and in order to... Um, finish this war, there, I mean, from, I live in Afghanistan, I live in Kabul, and from where I, I sit and where, well, from what I see, you know, um, women are being sold out. Um, negotiations are happening because they want to finish the war, but they're negotiating with terrorists 
people who have terrorized Afghanistan, who have terrorized Afghan women for decades. Um, the Taliban whipped women if they went out shopping, if they went to the doctor. They weren't allowed to go to, to the doctor. It, it was a, a situation where women were not allowed to be educated. I'm sure you know all of this, but I'm just going to repeat it just to refresh, refresh everything. Um, women and girls weren't allowed to go to school. They weren't allowed to be educated or become doctors. And women who were sick weren't allowed to go to male doctors. So it was a, a, a situation where there were no female doctors. Weren't, even fe female doctors who were educated uh, decades back weren't allowed to work. So female doctors weren't allowed to work, and females weren't allowed to go to male doctors. So they were basically there. They, they had no health care. Um, girls were not allowed to go to school. Schools were all co closed. Boys who went to school, they went to Islamic schools where they le just learned about the Taliban Islam, you know, the, the kind of Islam that they wanted people to know about. So <clears throat> right now the Afghan government, with the support of the U.S. government, is negotiating with these people. And they're, they're saying that the Taliban have become more moderate now. Last week they poisoned 150 schoolgirls in the north because they had gone to school. These are moderate Taliban they're trying to negotiate with. I'm really, I'm really scared for the future of Afghanistan. I don't know what's going to happen. And um, from, I mean, from my point of view, um, the Taliban don't, don't want to be part of the government. They want the whole government. If they wanted to be part of the government, they would run for elections. We, we have elections in Afghanistan now. There, there's a parliament. They could be members of parliament. They can stand up for elections and win seats if people want them to be in the government. They don't want to be part of it. They want the whole thing and they want to take over. And who knows what, what's going to happen. And I'm afraid that um, the, the, the US public is sick of this war in Afghanistan. That's, that's obvious. And I'm afraid that in, in a year, two years, three years, we'll, we'll be sitting behind our television screens again and wringing our hands and saying, oh, why, why did we stay quiet? Why did, why did this happen all over again? Under the watch of the US government, you know, women will, will be executed on, on television again. It's going to be, history is going to repeat itself all, all over again if we stay quiet and let the, the US government negotiate with those terrorists. So having said that about, Afghanistan, um, the Middle East is also going through a very scary time right now. Um, I heard somebody in a conference a few weeks ago who said that um, during the 70s, when the uh, Iran Shah was being overthrown and revolution was happening, she was, she was, she, she's not Iranian, she's of Indian descent. And she was oh, oh, happy and joyous and happy for the Iranian people because they were, you know, um, they were rising to the, uh, you know, bringing rev revolution and, and, and making people um, hear their uh, thing. They, they, and somebody told this Indian woman, why are you so happy? You know, you're a feminist. Don't you know what's going to ha happen? What, what's what's com coming up next? So I, I feel the same way for, uh, for the Middle East. When the Egypt, Egyptians were rising up, I was, I was, I wasn't very, I don't know if I, I don't I, my feeling was very uh, confused because yes, the Egyptians wanted to overthrow their president, but the Egyptians and the Middle East, is a, um, uh, the political uh, situation is so ripe for Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalists to take over that I thought, you know, w w women are going to lose in this. You know, p people might want uh, a, a new um, president or a new government or a new whatever, but women are going to lose at the end. And right now we're seeing that um, during, uh, in 2010, uh, Hosni Mubarak, who, who was the president at that time, uh, came up with a quota um, for for um, for parliament, and at that time, 68 women were elected to the Egyptian parliament. And right now, um, after after the revolution, the military 
you know, abolish that uh, quota. And ri right now, there are only five women in parliament. Um, Seventy percent of the seats are held by the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. So it's too early to tell as to what's going to happen in Egypt or Yemen or or uh, Libya or those other countries that are trying to rise up. But it, the same thing could happen as ha what's happening in Iran, in Afghanistan, because the culture is the same and Islam Islamic fundamentalists are so much stronger than regular people in these countries. So we, ha we have to be careful. Um, and it may be time to, uh, you know, to support women's groups on the ground there so they can be strong enough uh, to rise up if, if something like, the, like the, those things uh, happen. Um, I, can't, I can't really talk about what's ha what kind of programs are happening, uh, are happening or working in the Middle East because I'm, I, I don't work in that region, but in Afghanistan I can say that there are, there are hundreds of women's organizations working uh, on the ground, um, either uh, running schools or literacy classes, or, or as we do, we, we run um, family guidance centers and shelters in eight provinces. So we have 429 Afghans working for us in Afghanistan, local Afghans, men and women, and they're risking their lives every single day to save women mm -hmm. uh, from abuse, from torture, and all of this work, good work that's been happening. Since 2007, we've helped over 4,500 women directly, and all of this good work can be undone if the negotiations happen and if the Taliban win this again. Thank you so much for sharing that, Manisha. I think um, as you were speaking, one of the things that came to mind was um, last week at the AWID Forum, someone said something like, we have to be careful what we ask for because we don't know what's coming next. And so as you were speaking, that kind of struck me as we need to constantly be aware, constantly be mm -hmm. thinking about what's coming next, even in the guise of something that could potentially look good for women, um, but it may not necessarily be the case. And I think something else that struck me um, and that you may have noticed as well is that Manisha is, is one of the only people on this panel that isn't actually representing a women's fund. And so, you know, what opportunities are there for us to think creatively about how, you know, we can begin to think about any possibilities for leveraging resources, more, um, more resources for women's work that's happening on the ground. So I think maybe that's something we can get into and discuss a little bit more, uh, the possibilities of women's funds in the region is that something that you know we can start to think about but I'll pass it over to Tiffany next who will talk a little bit about the US um, sort of situation and scenario and the work that you've been doing also with the White House project so. absolutely so I don't know if all of you can feel but I'm sitting right next and I just want to hold your I just wanted to hold your hand the whole entire time that we were sitting here thank you very much for um, for your work and for being here um,